will now share my screen. Uh, okay, so I hope you can see the screen. So yeah. let me jump right in. <clears throat> and uh, I will try to keep my talk short so that we have more time for Q&A. So the question I'm trying to investigate in this paper is, is something which has been talked about and discussed a lot in the international and national media, which is, did BJP's electoral victory in 2014, which was a kind of game changer, which was a watershed in, in Indian political history, did that cause an increase in crimes against religious minorities. So right after uh, elections in 2014, many people noticed uh, uh, an increase in various kinds of crimes against religious minorities, especially against Muslims. And the New York Times ran a big article. The Washington Post had, had an article. And then there was a lot of writing on this in the Indian media. Now, I really got interested in this issue to try to see if we can find evidence of this claim that had been made by many activists and political analysts. And I thought that the social science tools that we learn could be brought to bear on this question to rigorously es establish or to not establish whether there was a causal link between the electoral outcome and the increase in crimes against religious minorities. So that is the question I'm investigating. Now to investigate that question, I need to have data on hate crimes against religious minorities. And there I face a big challenge because unlike many other countries in the world, Indian official statistics does not, does not include data on hate crimes against religious minorities. So therefore, I had to turn to an unofficial source, the Citizens Religions, uh, Religious Hate Crimes Watch, which was a group which was monitoring religious hate crimes in India and was publishing its data on a website. I used that data. And for other data, like election outcomes, I, I could get the data from the Election Commission, and I have some other variables I will talk about. So those are the two main data sources I have. The methodology I use is very popular and used a lot in, in the social sciences, which is a difference in difference research design, which gives us a, a kind of estimate of the causal impact of an event on the outcome variable that we are interested in, which in this case is hate crimes against religious minorities. So I will present the basic difference in difference result and then try to look critically at that and evaluate whether we can say that that's a causal effect we are getting. And I will take you through a set of results which, try, which will suggest that, yes, it is a causal effect, but there will still be some concerns about omitted variables. And I will try to address that problem using a, a novel method. And my basic finding from this investigation is that Yes, BJP's victory in 2014, Lok Sabha elections caused a significant increase in crimes against religious minorities, especially against Muslims. So that's the broad finding. And I would now like to take you through the details. So the, this investigation really contributes to two strands of contemporary literature. One, there is a recent and upcoming literature which tries to analyze the impact of the growth of right-wing populism Absolutely. in terms of violence against various marginalized groups, marginalized across uh, in, on, on religious lines, on immigration lines, on race lines. So there is a big literature on this, which is really emerging right now. But most of these studies have been focused on advanced capitalist countries like the US, Germany, UK, and I want to bring the literature in conversation with what is going on in India. So to the best of my knowledge, this is uh, one of the first papers to try to address the same issue in the context of India. 
Secondly, there is a large literature in history and political science which has studied uh, religious conflicts in India, mainly taking the form of religious rights, religious riots. Now, I, I would suggest that the, a new phenomena has emerged over the recent years, and probably we have seen a decline in the intensity and occurrence of riots, but it has been replaced by this new phenomenon of hate crimes. And therefore, I think it is important to widen this literature to include not only religious rights, but also incidents of uh, hate crimes and investigate them in greater detail as riots have been done. So in that uh, context, I provide, try to provide some evidence of a causal link between electoral outcomes and this, uh, the emerging phenomenon of hate crimes against religious communities in India. So those are the two ways in which this paper contributes to existing literature. So let me begin by defining what is a religious hate crime. So it is an event which has two characteristics. First, it is an incident that is prima facie a criminal act under the provisions of the Indian legal system. Second, and more importantly, this criminal act was partly or wholly motivated by the religious identity of, a, of the victim. So when we can ascertain that an event has these two characteristics, then we can say that it's an incidence of religious hate crimes. Now, as I said, it is challenging to investigate this in the context of India because there is no official data on this. So there was some discussion that the National Crime Records Bureau would release data on religious hate crimes, but that did not happen. And that's why I, I have used data from this independent citizens initiative, which collected data on hate crimes against religious minorities. Now, one important wrinkle is that this website, which came up in 2018 and was very popular and was used by news agencies across the world, abruptly closed down on 1st September 2019. So there was a, a short article in scroll which just said that this website is closed down. We don't know what happened. So the data that I used is no longer publicly available, but I have put it up on, on my website. So if anybody is interested, can actually look at it. Now, let me quickly talk about how this data was collected. And this I got from the, the, the things that were mentioned in this uh, initiative, the website from which I collected data. So they had a lot of details which to told us how this data was collected. And it shows that they did a very, very careful job and the data was really of good quality. So they would start from an English language news media report about a hate crime. And then they would go and do subsequent fact checking in other language media. So vernacular press, they would go back and check whether that event happened and corroborate the details about the various aspects of that event. Then this team had a group of legal experts which would look at the details of the events to make sure that it, it, was, it could be categorized as a religious hate crime, looking at these two criteria that I mentioned. So only then would they, they, they say that there was a religious hate crime, and then they would put up data on this religious hate crime on their website. And there were different details which were put up, community of the victims, religious community of the perpetrator, location of the crime, they would have data all the way up to the village level, the type of the crime, the motivation of the crime, whether it was related to cow vigilantism or other things, and whether a casualty happened, how many casualties. So all these details were there. So I downloaded data from this website on the number of hate crimes by different religious communities. And I divided it into the, the religious minorities, so the Muslims, Christians, and Sikhs, and all others, which is the, the majority religious community, which is the Hindu. So that is the basic data I use to track 
religious hate crimes over time. Now, one thing I would like to uh, mention right away is that the large literature that I mentioned in India from history and political science, which has studied religious riot, riots, and I am not studying religious riots, so it is important to, to highlight the difference between hate crimes, which I am studying, and religious riots, which has been studied uh, a lot in, in the Indian context. So the main difference is the following. So in religious riots, there, are, there is large scale violence. Many members of a community is attacked simultaneously and the direct loss of life and property is, is large. So examples of religious riots are the partition riots in 46, 47, Gujarat riots in 1969, riots after the Babri Masjid demolition in 1992, Gujarat riots in 2002, and so on. So all these are examples of uh, riots where there was direct loss of life and property, which was large. In contrast to that, in religious hate crimes, the target is often an individual or a family. The direct physical attack is on an individual or family. And therefore, the direct loss of life and property is relatively small. But what is important is that the psychological impact of the attack on the individual and family and the community to which the, the individual belongs is equally large. Because oftentimes, these hate crimes are, are motivated with the intention of terrorizing a whole community. And there are a lot of examples that I could give you. There was uh, an event in, in June 2019 where a young man, Tabrez Ansari, was branded a thief and beaten by a mob all through the night, was forced to chant Jai Shri Ram, and he died in hospital a few days later. And there are many such incidents which have been reported in the media. And these are examples of hate crimes, which you can see is very different from the religious rights, which were large scale events. Okay, now I get into the main content of the paper and I will try to provide some evidence that BJP's electoral victory in 2014 caused the rise in anti-minority hate crimes that we observed after 2014. But before I do that, let me quickly uh, talk about one question. So why, why might this be the case? So why is it at all, why is it at all interesting to study the link between BJP, BJP's electoral victory and the rise in anti-minority crime? So to answer this question, which is a kind of motivating question behind the empirical investigation, I draw on existing historical and political science literature which tells me that BJP is the political representative of Hindutva. Hindutva is a right-wing majoritarian vision of nationalism. It took place, it took shape in India in the early 19th century and gradually matured after that. Initial organizational form of Hindutva was in terms of two organizations, the Hindu Mahasabha, which was formed in 1915 and the Rashtriya Swamsevak Sangh, which was formed in 1925. Post-independence, the RSS completely overshadowed the Hindu Mahasabha and is currently the main organization, the fountainhead of this right-wing majoritarian vision of nationalism. Now, BJP is the political representative of Hindutva. And here, I draw on some interesting work by the political scientist Shumantra Bose, to understand what is the core principles that govern Hindutva. And he summarizes this in, in very nice ways. His claim is that the core principles of Hindutva are the following three. First, they believe in the innate unity of Hindus. Second, they conceptualize India as the land of Hindus, not as a melting pot of different cultural influences. And third, in this vision, Muslims and Christians living in India are visualized and understood as irreconcilable enemies of Hindudom. So the key conclusion I draw from this uh, quick 
analysis of, of the history and political science literature is that othering and demonizing Muslims and religious minorities is a non-negotiable core principle of Hindutva. And that is why when there was an unprecedented victory of BJP, the political representative of Hindutva in 2014, that gave a societal signal of the unmistakable rise of political dominance of this vision of nationalism. And that led to an increase in attacks on the other that was constructed by this political, uh, by this vision of nationalism. So that is why it makes sense to investigate the hypothesis that I'm looking at, which is that BJP's electoral victory caused the rise in anti-minority hate crimes. So now let me show you the evidence. And there are, so the main outcome variable is the number of hate crimes against religious minorities. The main treatment variable, that is the main event, is whether BJP won the largest vote share in 2014 in a given state. So what I will do is I will construct a state level panel data set on 28 states and union territories for the year 2009 to 2018. And I will use the variation across states in both hate crimes and BJP's performance in 2014 to kind of tease out the effect of that electoral outcome on the incidence of hate crimes. So I will also try to control for, for the differences across states and I do so in, in various ways. First, I'll, I'll control for the incidence of crimes. General crime rate might have increased. So I want to control for that. I want to make sure that I don't uh, compare small states with big states. So I control for population. I also want to make sure that I don't uh, compare poor states with richer states. So I control for per capita net state domestic product. I also control for literacy, share of the urban population and share of the Muslim population. But this data I don't have for every year. So what I do, I take the latest available data from 2011 and then interact it with the time dummy variable to partially control for literacy, urban population and Muslim population. So let me quickly talk about my empirical strategy and then I will show you the results. So this is the overview of what I do. I divide the states into two groups of states. One group of state I call BJP states. These are the states where BJP earned the largest share of popular votes in the 2014 Lok Sabha elections. The other states I call non-BJP states, and these are the states where BJP did not win the largest vote share in 2014. So with these two groups, what I do, I compare the change in anti-minority hate crimes between these two groups, between two periods. A five-year period before the elections, that is 2009 to 13, and a five-year period after the election that is 2014 to 2018. So that is the difference in difference strategy because I am looking at the change in anti-minority hate, uh, hate crimes across the, these two groups and I control for some of these uh, important variables that gives me a causal effect of BJP's electoral victory on the incidence of hate crimes. This is my basic result. I then subject it to various kinds of critical scrutiny. I want to make sure that the two groups of states would behave similarly if there were no electoral uh, outcome in 2014. So that's the parallel trends assumption. And I provide some evidence for that. I look at falsification tests. So I say, okay, let's take not 2014 when the election happened, but some other year to do this before after comparison. And if 2014 is important because the elections took place in that year, then if I use 2011 or 2012, then I should not get any significant effect. And that's what I find. Then I do another falsification test. 
let's say I use the hate crimes against the majority community, that is Hindus. Now, since Hindutva target does not target Hindus, there should not be any appreciable increase in the incidence of hate crimes if I use the incidence of hate crimes against Hindus. And I do that and I don't find any effect. And finally, I use the fact that hate crimes is a count variable. It's not a continuous random variable. So it is if one needs to take account of that and I use a quasi poison regression, I get the same effect. So all these kind of lead me to the conclusion that I initially got that BJP's electoral victory did increase the incidence of anti-minority hate crimes. But even after I have done all this, there might be two important concerns that remain. One, we could say that there is the, the reporting of hate crimes in the media itself is correlated with both state and time. So it is possible that those states which saw an increase in hate crimes after 2014 already had high hate crimes before 2014, but it was not being reported. So if that is the case, that is there is variable reporting rate across states, then it might be the fact that what I am report, what I'm reporting as the effect of the electoral outcomes, electoral uh, victory of BJP's effect on uh, hate crimes could very well be just be the artifact of variable reporting rate. There is another important concern. It is possible that BJP's campaign rhetoric in the run-up to the 2014 Lok Sabha elections both increased its vote shares in states where it won large majority of votes and also increased the incidence of hate crimes against religious minorities after the election. So therefore, this again would say that if I am not taking account of this, what I am reporting is really a biased result what I'm reporting is not therefore the effect of the electoral victory. So I can encapsulate both these concerns into an omitted variable problem, and then I can use a novel method to take account of the omitted variable problem. And when I do so, I, I find that my basic results really do not get washed out. My basic results that the electoral victory in 2014 caused an increase in hate crimes against religious community remains. So even after taking account of these kinds of concerns, my basic results remain. Okay, I would now like to show you some basic results. So let me uh, draw your attention to this table where I have given the total number of religion, the anti-minority hate crimes across the three uh, minority communities and also the majority communities for these two periods. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is this figure. So in the period 2009 to 13, total anti-minority hate crimes was 22, and it increased to 195 in the period 2014-18. So this immediately tells us that there was a large increase. Now, if we remove from this figure the number of hate crimes directed against the majority community, then we see that it increased from 21 to 169. So not only did the total number of hate crimes against religious minority increase, but it increased even with if even if after whatever uh, hate crimes was faced by the majority community. Let me show you some state level variation. So here on the X axis, I plot BJP's 2014 vote share in the 2014 election. Each dot represents a state. And on the Y axis, I have the change in the average anti-minority hate crimes between 2009 to 13, that five year period and the five year period, 2014 to 18. And you can see that there is a positive correlation between the two. So for states which saw which have high vote share, in those states, the increase in anti-minority hate crimes is 
is large. So they are positively related. You can also see an interesting case, Uttar Pradesh, which is a clear outlier. So its uh, vote share was about 43, 44%, but the increase in hate crimes between these two five-year periods was more than 40. So this is clearly an outlier. It is important to identify the outlier to make sure that my results are not driven by them. So when I report the regression results, I do one sort of regression for all the states and then I drop Uttar Pradesh and see whether the results are, are the same because I don't want to report a result if it is driven by one single outlier state. Okay, so let me quickly go to the basic difference in difference model. So this is the basic model I use. The dependent variable is the number of hate crimes in state S in period T. My states S goes from 1 to 28. So I have 28 states in my sample. And the time period T goes from 2009 to 2014, 2018. So I have uh, data on 2000 from 2009 to 2018. So this is the number of hate crimes. And the key regressor here is the interaction between these two things. So BJP subscript S is a dummy variable which takes the value one if BJP won the largest vote share in that state S. And after with a subscript T is a dummy variable again, which takes the value for 2014, 15, 16, 17, and 18, that is the post-election years, and takes the value zero for the pre-election years. And I have a state level fixed effect, I have a year fixed effect, and I have some controls. And my key interest is in this parameter beta one. So beta one will give me the expected increase in the incidence of hate crimes in the BJP states, versus the non-BJP states between the post-election and the pre-election year. So that is the causal effect I am after. So here is the basic results. <clears throat> so I, I run various specifications. In specification one, I have the basic model and I just include state and year fixed effects. In model, in specification two, I include the time variant controls. So population, uh, uh, population per capita state domestic product. And in the spe in specification three, I include uh, pre-treatment controls interacted with the after dummy. And in specification four, I include the log crime incidents as an additional control. And in specification five, I run the regression by dropping Uttar Pradesh. Now, it is important and interesting to note that the coefficient on this interaction term is always positive and significant. My specification number four is my preferred specification. So the coefficient here is 0.964. What does that mean? Now, the coefficient is 0.964. When I look at the pre-election years, the average anti-minority hate crimes per year was 0.157. So when I compare this coefficient with 0.157, I see that there is an increase in 514%. So therefore, my difference in difference estimates lead me to conclude that between 2009-13 and 2014-18, BJP states, so states where BJP won the largest majority of votes in the 2014 Lok Sabha elections, witnessed a 514% increase in anti-minority hate crimes compared to the non-BJP states. So this is my basic result. And now I will try to do various kinds of robustness checks. Now, since I am, uh, I want to keep my presentation short and have more time for discussion. Let me quickly show you the results. The first set of results that I want to show you is the parallel trends results. So this is important. The difference in difference methodology relies on the fact that the two groups of states I'm comparing would behave similarly 
with respect to the evolution of anti-minority hate crimes if the key event, that is the electoral outcome, did not happen. And the way to test that uh, is one visually, which we do here and in the next slide, uh, basic regression. So here what I have, I have plotted the average number of anti-minority hate crimes between these two groups. So the dotted line refers to the BJP states, the solid line refers to the non-BJP states. The red line, which the vertical red line is the year 2014. So to the left, we have the pre-election years, to the right, we have the post-election years. Now you can see that before 2014, the evolution of anti-minority hate crimes is similar in both groups of states. There is no major difference. But post-2014, you can see that BJP states, the, the anti-minority hate crimes increase far more than the increase in the non-BJP states. So it is important to note that there was an increase even in the non-BJP states. And that is why it is important to contrast the overall increase between these two groups of states and not look at the total or the average for all groups. Because the non-BJP states kind of second, uh. give us the counterfactual. What would have happened if BJP's electoral victory was not such a massive victory in the BJP states? And it is the comparison or the difference, the gap between these two groups of state, which give us an indication of the causal effect. So to conclude, you can see that before the election, the two groups of states were, were moving similarly as far as anti-minority hate crimes go. I can also provide you some regression evidence. So I run a regression where I regress the hate crimes against minorities on uh, all the controls that I had previously. But now I restrict my sample to the pre-election years, 2009 to 2013. And my key interaction term here is a time trend multiplied by the dummy variable, which gives me whether a, a state is a BJP state, meaning whether it, the state is where BJP won the largest majority of uh, votes in 2014. So if I look at the coefficient beta zero, it tells me whether the evolution of hate crimes against minorities moved similarly across these two groups of states. So if beta zero is not significantly different from zero, then I can conclude that before the election, the evolution of hate crimes in the two groups of state moved similarly. And that is what I get. So this is the coefficient estimate. You can see it is never statistically significant, which means that beta zero is not statistically different from zero and therefore the evolution of the anti-minority hate crimes in the two groups of states moved similarly before the elections. Okay, now let me show you. Yes, I will try to end in two minutes. I just want to show two falsification tests which kind of increase the confidence in my results. The first thing is, let me show you this graph. So here what I plot is the coefficient estimate when I use 2011 as the year to do a before after comparison. Now remember the election took place in 2014, so I should not get any effect when I do the comparison with 2011. And that is what you see, the coefficient is hardly different from zero. I do the same comparison with 2012, the coefficient is slightly positive, but if you look at the 95% confidence interval, it includes zero. So it is not statistically different from zero, the same with 2013. So all years before the election, the comparison does not give me any effect. That just tells me that 2014 is really the key year. The next thing I want to show you is another falsification test where Instead of looking at hate crimes against minorities, I look at hate crimes against the majority community. And I do the same regression. I should not find any effect of the, the election 
outcome on this variable because Hindu ideology attacks the religious minorities, not the religious majorities. So when I do the same regression in all specification where I include controls, I see that the effect is not statistically different from zero. So all of these together lead me to conclude that BJP's election outcome, unprecedented victory led to increase in hate crime. So I have some more results, which I will kind of skip so that we have more time for discussion. And if there are questions, I can come back to that. I would just like to end with one caveat, which is a weakness of my analysis. I have not investigated the mechanism behind the result. What exactly is it that is driving this result? And that is something I want to take up in future research. Here is one hypothesis. Electoral outcomes are a mechanism to aggregate information in society. So when there is a massive electoral victory of BJP, that validates anti-Muslim biases in society. Societal norms can rapidly change, which means that attacking Muslims becomes legitimate. Changing norms then seep into the law enforcement machinery and that leads to attacks against Muslims and other religious minorities. That is something that is a hypothesis. I want to test it later. So I will stop there. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm still uh, soaking in the 514% increase uh, in hate crimes. Uh, so this is a lot to reflect upon. I will also take this opportunity to uh, introduce the speaker to our Dean, uh, Professor Sudarshan, and to our Vice Dean, Professor Singh. So Sudarshan, would you like to start with a question, Maresh? No, no, I, I, I think this was excellent. Um, this is the kind of work we need, you know, in one sense, to the casual observer or to um, you know, very insightful journalists, uh, they've been reporting the same thing, right? So, um, but then, you know, people would then say, this is um, just a perception. Um, this, this is what seems to be the case, but, you know, are you sure that it's happened in a systematic way? Uh, can you actually find a, a serious causal connection between the BJP's victory and what's happened subsequently. So, so one of the you know, strengths of uh, this kind of analysis is to validate uh, what, we, you know, what we get to know uh, by other means, right? Um, now, it's important to do that because it's easy to, for people to dismiss reports of the journalists or any general perception by saying, oh, you're motivated because you're in the opposition, you don't like the BJP and um, things like that. So this, this is a classic case of uh, demonstrating, um, you know, scientifically, I mean, using um, uh, the right techniques to show that, you know, look, this connection is, uh, is incontrovertible. Now, then you may find out, you know, by what means it comes about. But uh, as um, uh, Professor Dipankar Basu has shown, it's incontrovertible that, that this has happened, uh, the increase in uh, hate crimes, uh, particularly against the Muslims um, after the BJP electoral victory. Now we can now discuss as to you know, what we could do about it, why that's happened and so on. And even the outlier case of the Uttar Pradesh is not at all surprising uh, because you know, in Uttar Pradesh is really the crucible where the BJP has uh, been confident enough to have um, a person um, like um, the Adityanath, Yogi Adityanath as the chief minister, who was a surprising choice um, from a political perspective at the time. Um, and so, you know, th this is, um, and it also, you know, demonstrates to our students why it's important to learn um, these tools and techniques, um, because you know, social science is always, um, you know, uh, it cannot be have the certainty of uh, uh, results in experimental natural science. 
Um, and so we need to know when social science is being used well um, and the tools and techniques are used well. And what are the limitations of those results, right? Uh, as as um, uh, Professor Vasu points out, it doesn't tell you how come it happened. Um, you know, what were the dynamics of uh, actions on the ground that led to these hate crimes. Uh, but the starting point is to demonstrate that there is this close causal connection between the election result and what happened subsequently is a good use of these techniques. So it's important to know what are the limitations of the techniques as well as why and how to may use them well. So thank you very much, Professor Dipangar Basu. This has been a very good lesson, um, not only for um, the subject that you're dealing with, but also as to how to use um, uh, economic techniques um, well um, and how to be careful um, about uh, validating them with you know, falsification tests and possibilities that you eliminate um, by um, statistical analysis. So thank you. Okay, just, uh, uh, Naresh, did you have a question? Yeah, quickly, uh, Professor Basu, thank you so much for uh, excellent presentation. Uh, really well done. The, I, I, um, I, I want to ask a question that, uh, and to put, push your mind a little bit to go beyond what you call the limitation of your study, or you call it the weakness of the analysis. I don't think it's at all a weakness of the analysis. It's a limitation in that you stop before you get you got into the mechanisms of causation. Um, but you do have some hypotheses and they look quite plausible, the ones on the screen. So the question is, would you hazard some guesses as to solutions? If these hypotheses were correct, what might be some solutions? You know, your the broader import is of great concern. I mean, you know, this is an important issue to a secular democratic state. And as a political scientist, you must be thinking, what can be done? What can be done differently? Can politics be done differently? Can political scientists have some insights that can help or do we have to turn to another discipline? So that's my question to you, Professor Batsu, if you can extend your mind a little bit. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's a, a difficult question. So, I mean, I would, I would hazard a, a, a guess that. Uh, so, okay. Let me say one thing. So, this the phenomena that we are observing is a is a worldwide phenomenon. It has something to do with the rise of uh, right wing populist regimes across the across the world. So. One way to address that would be to, to, to uh, champion a politics which, which, uh, which is against such a vision of society. So uh, more pluralistic uh, politics, if that kind of politics were to replace this uh, narrowly uh, understood vision of politics, then that would certainly lead to a reduction in the attack on various marginalized groups across the world. So, I mean, that's a very broad answer. It's not a policy prescription. It is a more a political process. The political process which has led to forces like BJP becoming dominant needs to be reversed. Uh, so that's a big and difficult question. <laughs> I, I really don't have an answer beyond that. That's reasonable, thank you. Okay, uh, so we have some hands up and there is somebody who's typed a question on the chat box. So we will go one by one. So uh, Avanindra, your question, yeah. please. Yeah, uh, it's a basically a thank you very much, Professor Basu for you know such a nice and fascinating um, presentation. So look, uh, what I can perceive from your paper that you know if you look at uh, the year from 2011 onwards, uh, there's just a rise in, uh, uh, you know, uh, this kind of uh, incidents, however, not statistically significant, but there's an upward trend. 
which indicates that in some sense, this kind of communal feeling is on the rise since 2011. So the only thing is that what I think after 2014, they got a voice, they got a kind of you know, confident that whatever they would do might be protected by the state. So after 2014 elections, of course, uh, it somehow explains that how it, all of a sudden that kind of violence increased because they might, the group might think that they had some kind of protection there. So, but my question is, uh, firstly, what was the basic reason, do you think, that why this communal hatred actually was on the rise from 2011 onwards? Okay, so, well, because I think the rise of BJP or in 2014 was in fact the, the outcome of the rise of that kind of hatred, because the polarization which actually happened, which began, I think, much before, culminated into the victory of the Modi government. So in 20, 2014. So I'm, it's my query, or it's my basically what actually led to the rise of that kind of uh, hatred there. Do you find any economic reasons behind that? Or, or it's basically what happened all of a sudden, that what 2011 onwards, uh, communal hatred was on the rise. Of course, 2014, uh, what, what we saw after 2014 is, uh, I think is a manifestation. That's, that's clearly, uh, you know, people showed what they already had in mind in, 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 in some part of the population. So, so I'm, I'm very curious about that. What was the basis of the rise of that kind of mindset? And, and, and the first and secondly, do you, have, do you see any uh, relationship between uh, uh, the, this kind of crime with the proportion of minority, the share of minority in that state? So is it, in, it is insignificant? Yeah, I'm, I hope I made myself clear. Yes, yes. Uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, your intuition is correct. And uh, the, the electoral outcome in 2014 was partly the result of previous communal mobilizations. And that is why uh, it is important to to separate out the effect of the general communal mobilization from the effect of the electoral victory itself. So the elect, so suppose, let's think of a hypothetical situation where there was communal mobilization, but BJP did not win. My hypothesis is that that would not lead to an increase in hate crimes to the extent we have seen, because the winning of the election is important in in the valid, the wider validation of this kind of ideology in society, which is then not condoned, uh, which is not condemned by then important leaders, which then seeps into the law enforcement machinery, and then the crimes go unpunished, and that kind of leads to a cycle. So I think the election outcome is an important. Uh, trigger which actually amplifies this underlying communal uh, feeling, tension, mobilization. So that is why I was focusing on the election. Now, it is correct that there was an underlying uh, increase in communal mobilization, and I have not really investigated that in great detail. But I think it is the broader political process where uh, alternatives to BJP was kind of going downhill. The Congress was, was not doing that well. That created a platform for BJP to emerge as the only alternative. Now, one thing that I, I point, want to point out is that when the, the, the BJP won in 2009, uh, sorry, so, so when the BJP won in 2014, Prior to that, the election campaign relied much more on emphasizing economic issues, jobs, uh, the rising youth, employment possibilities of, of, of the youth. So uh, I remember that it, the election campaign was much more focused on those kinds of issues and highlighting the, the problems in the Congress and presenting itself as the alternative to take India to a new growth path. 
that was the focus of BJP's campaign to a large extent in, in 2014. So I think even though there was underlying communal mobilization, especially in Uttar Pradesh, in the national context, it was much more downplayed. And I think it is only post 2014 that this kind of uh, politics kind of gets wider space. But your question remains, and, and I don't have really, I don't really have a good answer. What led to an increase in communal mobilization around 2009, 10, 11? So I, I don't have an answer to that. Now, your second question about the proportion of, of uh, uh, Muslims and whether that is important. So that I, I have not, I have used it as a control variable. So I have not really looked at the coefficient on that variable. One reason is that we don't have annual data on proportion of Muslims. So the only data point I have is 2011, and then I will have a data point when the 2021 census is available. So since I did not have reliable yearly data on the share of Muslim population across states, I have not used it, used the coefficient on that variable to infer whether the proportion of Muslim population has an impact on hate crime. So I have not looked at that. Yeah. Anything related to a crisis, post-crisis uh, financial crisis effect? Well, just I'm curious. Uh, no. I mean, I certainly think that the BJP emerged as the leading party because it could project itself as the alternative to this corrupt, decrepit Congress, which was going down. And there was all these uh, movement about, against corruption, which it could mobilize in its interest. And it projected itself as the party which would generate employment for the youth. So I clearly remember that as the major uh, campaign rhetoric post uh, before 2014. And I think all those things were, were important, but BJP's core agenda was uh, not highlighted to the extent that became clear after the elections. Okay, uh, so uh, how about we, we have, you know, we're running out of time. How about we collect some questions? Uh, so okay. you please, you can take note. Uh, so Karthik and then Arjun, if you can keep your questions uh, brief, please. Karthik? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Basu, for the excellent uh, presentation. It was really enlightening and insightful. Uh, sir, my, uh, I'm a newly admitted student uh, in a school of public policy, and I'm from Patna, Bihar. So I, uh, I haven't really got into PhD to understand all the variables that you told, but I understood the insights and the results that you have given us. I have a question regarding the data that you have uh, uh, taken from that organization. Uh, so uh, um, I, um, I have been into uh, uh, I have been in touch with current affairs for a, a, a long time, and there have been uh, reports uh, when this tolerance and intolerance debate took place that uh, uh, these uh, uh, hate crimes or uh, uh, these cow vigilantism is not something uh, uh, that is happening new in India. They have always been there. Uh, it's an Indian Express report, sir. Uh, uh, and uh, um, these were the uh, these happened due to local politics or the village level uh, uh, politics and between the commu uh, communities between family due to some local issues. It's just that there were uh, these were uh, there were under reporting due to the large scale uh, uh, riots that were happening at uh, during those times. I mean, prior to 2014, especially in uh, UP, which saw 80 riots in just one year, 80 plus riots in just one year uh, so uh, my question to you is uh, how uh, uh, reliable is the uh, data of this organization 
uh, considering that it relies completely on reporting of these uh, hate crimes. Also, the context uh, of this question is that uh, there uh, post 2014, there have been many reports of hate crimes, which have been later found out that uh, that incident happened due to prior uh, uh, prior tensions between the two families belonging to different communities, which were given a shade of hate crime later on. So uh, uh, just a, a question uh, because I, uh, of my limited understanding and, of, uh, and thank you again for this great insightful presentation, sir. Okay, good question. Okay, uh, Arjun, please keep your question brief. Okay, I'm sorry, we've run out of time. Uh -huh. So yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, so man, uh, using your study as a reference, uh, when we look at, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you're audible, yeah. you're audible. So, Using your study as a reference and looking at the strategy of BJP of penetrating into state level administrations, be it in Bengal or in, uh, let's say, in Tamil Nadu or in other states, has hate, the data of looking at the data uh, of um, uh, anti minority hate crimes in India, has hate crime been used as a particular tool for them to increase the sen uh, Hindutva sentiments in certain states, uh, especially uh, when, we, when you take the example of Chris? Instance, uh, uh, how it has impacted in, let's say, the, the vote share in uh, Tamil Nadu, or uh, it, and that's one question. Second question is, uh, it, it's to add on to what uh, Avinindra uh, sir was talking about. Uh, more than the financial crisis, how has, uh, let's say, uh, the series of uh, uh, terrorist attacks that have happened in the UP2 regime affected uh, these uh, uh, anti-minority sentiments, uh, hate crimes in India? That's a, uh, those are two questions I have. And it was a brilliant presentation, so thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, Dipankada, you, you should respond to those uh, before. I mean, yeah, those are pretty hefty questions. And then I'll come to Harshit, and then we have two more questions, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. So those, those are really important questions. Let me uh, first try to address the question about data. So as I said, it would have been best if uh, there was official data on religious hate crimes. So in many countries, so I know a little bit about the US. In the US, race motivated hate crimes were not, data on that was not collected in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Because of public pressure, it gradually started getting collected. Only then now do researchers have reliable data on that phenomenon. In India, that is not the case. Now, therefore, if you want to study this phenomena, you have to rely on alternative sources. Now, that is the only source that was available. And that's why uh, many researchers, including myself, have used it. There is no question that there is questions of uh, reliability because of reporting. Now, you pointed out that uh, there might be problems of under-reporting. Uh, I think that is correct because all the incidents that happen do not get reported. Now, the problem that a researcher like me faces is that there is no way in which I can validate the data I have, or I can say that the data is not reliable. All the information that was put on the website seemed to suggest that the group did a really good task of checking the details of the, the incidents Sometimes they traveled to the place where the incident happened, talked to the people concerned, got reports from the local police station. So only after thoroughly checking all the details of the event, did they actually count that as a hate crime and then put it up. So I am completely relying on that. Somebody, uh, if, if, if I were to take this work forward, probably I would have to generate my own data. Or if the official statistics started, official, uh, uh, like the, the National Crime Records Bureau, if it started collecting data on this, that would really be the best. But your point about uh, reliability of data is, is well taken but as i said this is the only data we have to study this so there is nothing that can be done about that now to come to arjun's question the, the 
the fact that it might be hate crimes which has increased vote share is very very correct and that is why that is one of the concerns that remain after my analysis and that is why i want to uh, take account of that and to make sure that my result remains robust even if this kind of a mechanism exists and that is why i do the test of uh, calculating the bias adjusted treatment effect so what i do there is to allow for this kind of a mechanism to be in place where previous hate crimes lead to increase in vote share which in turn leads to higher hate crimes so to make sure that my result that i get i am getting the effect of the election itself and not this kind of a, a effect of hate crimes on vote share i i calculate the bias adjusted effect now i have not been able to show you the details the the details of the, that effect if you are interested i can i can share share my paper with on on that uh your question about whether terrorist attacks led to an increase in 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 uh crimes against minorities i'm i'm not really uh sure that there have been lot of terrorist attacks in india which could have led to increase in in uh, in feelings of antipathy against uh, minorities so i i don't think that is a important factor okay uh I'm sorry. I'm going to rush uh, because Paritosh has waited patiently. So he writes in the chat uh, chat box. Do you think it is worth factoring in statutory laws and judicial decisions as variables that might have an effect on hate crimes? Well, the 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 way the law enforcement machinery works across states is certainly an important factor, and uh, since there are no real laws against hate crimes at least it was not there at that point uh, there was no way to bring that into the analysis but it is true that some states have brought in some laws against cow vigilantism over the last few years and if this analysis were to be done again probably those legal changes that have happened across some certain some of these congress states should be taken into account okay okay harshana has a question is the growth of majoritarianism the result of the government being pro hindutva and hence the people are influenced or is it because the people believe in such ideologies and hence such a government is in power that's a great question uh the, a social scientist always faces a challenge in in uh, in trying to say which is causing what so is it people's beliefs and acceptance of hindutva which has given rise to bjp or is it bjp's mobilization which has led to the growth of uh, hindutva ideologies acceptance uh, among the larger population now we, one way to answer this question is to take a historical approach so let me ask you to go back when did hindutva start if we go back to the early 20th century hindutva emerged as one strand in the in the political sphere in india so it was not the dominant strand the dominant stand strand of uh, nationalist politics in india was the secular democratic strand but there were certain majoritarian and minoritarian strands also it is the continued work of that strand of politics which has made it acceptable its ideology acceptable in the population which in turn gets reflected in its higher vote share and therefore it's becoming the the dominant party in in parliament so if you go through if you take a historical perspective then it seems to me that it is the the ideology and its formation into an organization and its uh work among the people propagating its ideology and doing various kinds of uh work which leads to people accepting its ideology which then leads to it coming to power so that is the causal chain that i think i find useful 
Okay, uh, and this one, I don't know if you have data to say anything on this. How has the nature of hate crimes against minorities changed between BJP uh, 1.0 and BJP 2.0? Your data is just count data, right? I mean, whether something occurred or not, right? I mean, right, right. So if by BJP 2.0, you mean 2019 onwards, as I said, the data No, sets... no, no. Uh, uh, Vajpayee Advani versus Modi Shah. Oh, well... Uh... So my data, the, this data starts in 2009 and goes up to 2018. Yeah, so, so that earlier period is not... Earlier period is kind of uh, not part of the data. Now, the earlier period, people have data on, on riots, but hate crime data is not available. Okay, I have listened very patiently. I'll just make two points. Uh, and this is uh, to re in response to what Karthik said, two things, you know, that's coming to my mind. You're right that a lot of these things that are termed as ethnic uh, conflict or whatever can be sort of, you know, sort of score settling by another name. And, you know, I've done some work on the partition of India and these things do happen. But I think the important point to remember here is even if you sort of recoded some of these cases sort of, you know, sort of retroactively as not hate crime, you still will not be able to wipe away an effect of 514%, right? I mean, even if some cases were miscoded, right? I mean, the effect would come down to what, like maybe 400%, that would still be, uh, you know, a, a substantial, uh, you know, effect. Uh, and I think that is one of the things that the paper does very well. It is asking, okay, how big does omitted variable bias have to be? I mean, can omitted variable bias wipe out these findings? And I think that, that a lot of the paper's work is uh, focused uh, on establishing that. I should also say the paper has been published in world development. So you're all welcome uh, to uh, uh, look at it. And on that note, I mean, we've run out of time. So I would like to say thank you to Professor Basu. Uh, thank you for giving the talk, the, for giving your time. And one more thing, uh, some students have requested the PowerPoint slides. So if you could just share it with me after the talk. Sure, I, I will share it. And the copy of the paper, I, I mean, I have shared it with you. So feel free to share it with students who, who are interested. Okay, I will uh, share it with the students. And thank you also to uh, Gita and Shivangi, our seminar coordinators for making this possible. Thank you very much. And Please do share that with me as well. Huh? Yes, yes. Please do share share. That with me. I will share. I will yeah. share. I will thank positively you. share. Thank you. Thank you, Dipankar. Again, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Bye. Thank you Bye. so much. Bye. 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 Bye.